So I got the impression that there's just a massive difference between where everybody's at. So you're already actively involved in the Forex market. You've traded options. You've never traded it before at all. What about you? I've lost what, so much money in a while, almost divorced me. <laughs> See, that's what I was telling him before you came in. That was the conversation we were having, is it's very expensive. Uh, and then, Fan? Um, I changed some stuff, and then we'll be changing the points and options stuff. So okay. I'm kind of like getting into I'm a programmer by myself, so okay. we see how doing the program as well as business strategy chain, uh, trading. Okay. Yeah, and that's kind of why I didn't prepare a big presentation, as I wasn't sure where everybody was coming from, so I didn't know what would be appropriate. So. I think really what is best is to start out with the high level problem for how do you go about algorithmic trading and we'll do it with a programming type approach because I think everybody in here codes to some degree. So you really just have a couple of very simple problems. You have, you need to get data, you need to analyze it, and then you need to trade. So really simple on the surface, but when you are trying to go about this, all of these can be huge obstacles. So for example, let's say that I want to trade Forex data, or I want to trade Forex, and I don't know anything about the market. I don't know what software is common. If I was doing this and I wasn't using regular software, I would have to go looking high and low on the internet, and the quality of the data you don't necessarily know anything about, and you don't know where to even start looking. So if you were trying to do a free option, you might go look somewhere like Yahoo Finance where you can get data on lots of stuff that is mostly end of day. It's certainly not high frequency, but you can kind of get a sense for most securities. You can get some options data. You can get Forex. Um, you can get some indices and some futures data, but not really all that much. Uh, you, there are also paid options, but they're not really designed for retail traders. And everybody in here sounds like they're a retail trader. So it's really, in the market, there's two types of people we talk about. There's institutional, and they work for hedge funds, they work for mutual funds, they work for guys that manage $50 million to several billion dollars. And then there's guys like ourselves that have regular jobs and then decide that they want to trade and they're interested in algorithmic trading. So. The paid option is not really a good one. Uh, if you're trying to buy data, usually it starts at several thousand dollars per instrument and goes up from there. It's designed for institutions and it's just generally out of the retail trader's league. Uh, and then finally, you can get it from the broker yourself. Although again, the quality of the data is very different. And the reason I keep talking about data quality is that when we go on to analyze and come up with potential ways that you might want to trade algorithmically. If you have garbage data, you have a garbage analysis. So you have to be very careful about the data that you decide to accept. Is it faulty or delayed or? Sometimes it's just wrong. Um, sometimes there's duplicate entries. Uh, sometimes there's gaps in the data that are unexplained and if you don't really know what you're looking for, what kind of problems there might be in the data, you can come up with some weird discoveries. Um, Local machine parts did wrong. Yeah. IBFX. Yeah, there's, I mean, basically, if you have, if you get free data, you're getting what you pay for, and even if it comes from a reputable broker, yeah. it's still going to have some problems. So you have to be very careful before you go into all the cool quant stuff that. Yeah you've actually been careful with what you accept. And then other times there are platforms slash APIs of all sorts of different companies that offer all of this stuff all in the same product. So the advantage to those types of software is that it makes your life a lot easier because if you go about this on your own, it's a monumental task. Okay, And then the analysis I've heard all sorts of stuff that there's a lot of Python programmers in here, um, a lot of people that like to play with R. Um, so you can use, I mean, you can just custom program your own research platform. I've done that plenty of times. 
where I just create a little text file and parse it, and then I start doing all the analysis in it. You can do R, you can do MATLAB, and then again, you can use somebody else's platform and API. And then when it comes time to trade, if you've done custom or R or MATLAB or all that stuff, you have the same problem where you have to build your own platform or build within a platform, and then you have to have some kind of separate application to start pushing through the trades. Or if you have a platform where everything's already written, you can do this all in the same spot, and it makes your life a lot easier. So the title of the chat is Forex Common or Popular Forex Platforms, and this is the option that we're talking about. So it allows you to obtain the data without, and we'll go through the caveats, but you can generally believe that the data is reasonable quality if not solid. You can do all the analysis on the data and you can place trades. And you can do that all in one fell swoop without having to recode everything three times. Okay, so in Forex, the most popular platforms are MetaTrader, you have NinjaTrader, and you have TradeStation. But this is, I mean, I probably shouldn't have called it this, the seminar or whatever we're calling it Forex specific because most of these are popular with different groups. And then there are some broker specific ones that are really popular. Thinkorswim comes up the most often. Okay, so these are just different software options, and there's nothing special about them. It's just what everybody happens to like and is really common throughout the market. So if you like trading Forex, MetaTrader is overwhelmingly the most popular. You can literally find more than a thousand brokers around the world that offer MetaTrader. I mean, it's gigantic. You really have your pick. You can pick your different country, your size, liquidity, all that stuff. NinjaTrader is getting more popular with Forex, but for the most part, it's futures traders. So guys that like trading uh, the S&P minis, that like trading beans, coffee, I mean literally anything futures, I don't know why, but everybody loves NinjaTrader. And then finally, TradeStation, they have their fair share of futures traders, but for the most part, People that mess with TradeStation trade equities. So they like being involved in the stock market, and it makes it really easy to hook everything together. And then Thinkorswim is really equities as well. So I just want to check in with everybody. Does everybody kind of understand the platforms and why it's advantageous to go with the platform? Um, multi charts. Yeah, multi charts is. Sort of the illegal cousin of the trade station. <laughs> Multi Charts is a Russian company, and oh, yeah. <laughs> Tra okay, so all of these platforms use their own different language. So MetaTrader uses a custom language called MQL4, which is really a C scripting language. Okay, NinjaTrader uses C Sharp. Uh, net 3.5. TradeStation and MultiCharts use a language called Easy Language, which for all the programmers in here will probably bore you to tears. Uh, it's super simple. These two are not object oriented, and obviously this one is. And Easy Language got popular because it was not designed for programmers, it was designed for Joe retail trader that is intimidated by programming. So if you wanted to buy, let's pretend you had two bars. This bar closed up above this bar. So you might say if the close of one bar ago is greater than the close of two bars ago, then buy at market. And it, it has that English-like 
syntax. So it's totally not intimidating for somebody that doesn't have any programming background at all. And this is all a long way of tying this back into multicharts. Okay, so TradeStation got popular because this language was so simple. And it has a lot of cool features that solve these three problems, the data analysis and hooking up to live trading. So what multicharts did was they basically just piggybacked entirely off TradeStation and stole their entire platform, including their custom language, and then offer it at a hefty discount. <laughs> And now they've gotten more established, so they offer a lot of new features, but it's the TradeStation ripoff that is slowly evolving into its own platform. Okay. How compatible is the, is the uh, power language versus easy language? Is it 100% or no. 99? Yeah, it's like 97, 98. Yeah, I mean, you're going to break it. So I have developers, when we get an easy language project, a lot of them will choose to work with multicharts, and then inevitably, the client gets it and they're like, <laughs> you know, what? You, what? you know, you didn't test this, what yeah. happened? And the problem is that these these are very, very similar, but yeah, they, they are there are differences. And especially as TradeStation adds new features, especially like the, the GUI work and um, anything that is more complex than this, that's where it just runs off the rails. Okay, so I've covered the languages, the markets they cover, and then um, the other problem that I mentioned is really data. So these platforms offer very different setups and they're all handle the problem differently. So MetaTrader is kind of like the AK-47 of trading platforms. So <laughs> you download it and it doesn't matter how novice or not good with computers you are, you're going to have a hard time not figuring out how to work the platform. It's stupid simple, it's very friendly, uh, it's also not sophisticated. So if you're trying to do something sophisticated, that's probably not the place to be. And for your analysis, you have to be very, very careful. Because when you download MetaTrader, it, charts just pop up. And you think, oh, this is great, I got my data and everything looks good. But the problem is that most of the time the data is junk. So you can't actually rely on it and do any serious analysis. And getting the data and getting it formatted to MetaTrader is <laughs> the most convoluted, <laughs> difficult problem that I face every day because this is the platform that we deal with and everybody has problems with their back testing and getting familiar. So it's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> Right. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, it's very useful to know. Yeah, it's very bad data. How, what's the resolution of it? use it for real money. That's why I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's good enough if you want to trade every couple of minutes and you're not super execution sensitive and you are just trying to get something up cheaply. Like, so if you trade every four hours and you trade three currencies, perfectly fine. There's MetaTrader's fantastic. But if you're trying to scalp or day trade or trade 20 different currencies at the same time, that's a disaster because this isn't multi-threaded. So every time you push an order into the market, it can only handle it one at a time. So if you have five orders going together, this one has to finish and you have all the latency in the middle where they connect and then bounce and then trade confirm. Okay, now we can do this guy and repeat the process. So if you're pushing too many orders through, this will, ch will, ch will choke. Is that problem still a case with MetaTrader 5 or was that just with 4? Um, you know, honestly, I don't know. We haven't messed with MetaTrader 5 enough in the live market to have that come up yet. What's the resolution of the data that you can download? It's very restricted. So MetaTrader doesn't offer very much in the way of flexible time frames. And it's actually a big problem in the market. So with MetaTrader, you get one minute, five minute, 15 minute, 30 minute, and then you get one hour, four hour, daily, weekly, monthly. And how much can you download at once? Uh, it depends on the broker and their settings. So if you are loading one minute data, some of them will let you load a month and that's it. Some of them have no throttle on it and as long as you tell it to stop auto-scrolling, which is, so when you load a chart, it 
uh, if you scroll this way mm -hmm. and then a new tick comes in, it pushes you back to the present. Very sophisticated. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, can you store the data? I mean, why not just write a routine that just collects everything that you need? You could do that. Okay. Um, that, that. That would be fine, but for people that want to do like five years of testing, that's a long waiting period. Even with sure. continuous contracts, it's limited by what the chart will hold. It's a, it's a big mess. It's a horrible mess. Yeah, you have to... I mean, the brokers don't want you to have all this stuff. It's not like a conspiracy. It's the more people pinging their servers and downloading 50 megabytes worth of data times 10,000 users, right. not fun. Uh, Ninja Trader is a lot different. They don't give you data. <laughs> but they make it easy to get data, but you have to go buy it. So MetaTrader, you get data for free. It loads very simple, but it's junk. Ninja Trader, you have to find somebody to give you the data. So there are some free <coughs> options. There are some, there's one that's free called Kinetic, yeah. and they give you end of day data. And then with the brokerage, they have their own policies. So MetaTrader is its own standalone platform. You just download MetaTrader, you're hooked up to the broker. Ninja Trader is designed to be something totally different, where you have all of these, so I'm totally run out of space. Okay, the problem when you're programming all this stuff and you're trading in the live market, if you program to a broker specific platform, <clears throat> you probably spent four to six months developing and testing it and getting it working and a lot of money and time, so that if you go to start trading live and you're not happy with the broker, too bad, you married them. So what NinjaTrader did is, let's say that this is brokers A, B, and C. NinjaTrader is here. They shove the broker AB API on top of it so that you can write your strategy here in NinjaTrader, and then they've done all the integration with every broker partner they have. So it's a different way to handle the same problem. MetaTrader just goes to these brokers and say, you should use our platform, you should use our platform. So if you've developed a MetaTrader, you can go switch on a whim. If you have NinjaTrader, you can go switch on a whim. But it's not its own. You don't just have Ninja Trader. You have to download the broker platform. Then you download Ninja Trader. Then you get everything hooked up and make sure it's nice, which is effective and it does work. But it's certainly not user friendly. There's a steep learning curve uh, with getting this all set up to the point where you can actually download historical data and <coughs> start trading with your broker. Once you have the data set up, though, Ninja Trader is awesome. I love doing the analysis in NinjaTrader, so I had, it took me weeks to get to the point where I was motivated enough to go through this process and figure it out, but once I did, I was really happy with it because I know the data is good and the analysis is great and it runs C-sharp, so which, that's what I have to program in most of the time. So for me, it's just a great fit. TradeStation, multi-charts, these, these offer the same quality of analytics as NinjaTrader, but again, the problem with TradeStation is just like I said, where if you program for a specific platform, you've married your broker. If you program for TradeStation, you can trade with TradeStation. But you can't go trade with anybody else. So it is easier to develop in, and it is easier to, uh, to test and all that stuff, but if you're ever unsatisfied with the broker because they slip you or because they charge bad commissions or whatever goes wrong with your trading, you don't have any alternative. You got to go reprogram everything from scratch. Uh, could you could you elaborate more on on the uh, the reasons why I might be upset with the broker? Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. There's all sorts of reasons you'll be upset with the broker. Yes. I used to work as a broker, so I can give you a long and distinguished list of all the angry calls I had for two years. <laughs> Okay, number one, bad service. You call in and talk to somebody that treats you like you're talking to somebody at Chase or Wells Fargo. They don't, you're, there's somebody in a call center and they don't really care about you. Number two, bad execution. 
This one is going to be the big one. I had a client just ask me about this today because he thought it might be a programming problem. So he's trying to buy zero dollar, and let's say that the current, actually the current price is 3180. Okay, every single time he trades, the broker requotes him and says, ah, I just got your order, now the price is 81. So he has to pay more every single time he trades. Or let's say that, well anyway, point is, they show him one price, he places his trade, and then they just play some games and say, oh, that's not where you can trade, you're going to have to accept this worst price, and they don't give him the option to do something else. Um, they have poor banking relationships, so it's entirely possible that you're dealing, and if, this is especially true in Forex. I, there are literally brokers in every jurisdiction around the world, from hugely developed capital markets like the US and the UK, and then you have guys in Belize and in Panama. So you have all the options and they'll probably take your account, but the quality of the bank is not all that great. There's no regulation or oversight, literally. So it's just you and the business and you take their word for it. Um, you could have bad latency which is really related to the poor execution. Um, you can just have, literally, the software goes down, so it crashes. I've had that plenty of times. Clearing firm is the same place as the custodian, which is... Yeah, you have the conflicts of interest. <laughs> where they, kind of, they play these kind of games, which is, I guess, yeah, it's a, another form of bad execution, but same, same story, different details. So within all these things, is it like the same of having like airline loyalty that some people will always have bad experiences with United and some people will always like American Airlines yeah. or something like that? Yeah, no, that's, that, that's largely the case except with brokers it tends to be even more well-founded. Okay. So like if I have a bad experience with United, it's because somebody gave me bad service. Like somebody mouthed off to me one too many times. If I get bad execution, that doesn't have anything to do with me having a bad experience. It has, you just stole my money, which is a lot more emotional. You get really worked up when, okay, you've gone through this whole process, right? You've done all the analysis. You've been stiked about trading for probably a couple of months. It's all you're thinking about. You load, you load your life account, and then they start stealing from you. You're, you're not a happy camper. So, so does, does that happen across the board? Do people try and play those games? Yeah, that's the biggest issue in algorithmic trading right now. Um, there's a great book that I read a couple of months ago, and it's completely in line with this group. It's called Dark Pools. Oh, yeah. And it's basically about how all the institutional algorithmic trading steals your money fractions of a penny at a time. And that's all through basically institutionalized corruption, where it's supposed to be a fair and transparent market where everybody places, there's, there's supposed to be two prices, the bid and the ask. But what's happened is that there's all of these different places where you can trade. This is for stocks. So let's say that this is NASDAQ. There are all these different pools where you can trade, and they all have their own bid and ask. So sometimes, because you have all these different connections, there's latency between them. So you have different prices, which means that you can make money for free. Sometimes the buy price will be less than the sell price. It's like buying a car for $10,000 and then immediately selling it for eleven. dollars Of course, you're going to do that if you find a dealer stupid enough to do that. But that nobody's dumb enough to do that in real life. The only reason those kind of things happen is because of technological accidents. So you have that kind of thing. And then because you have all these different pools, they give segmented priority. So in a free and fair market, you're supposed to really just have three types of order. A limit order, a stop order, and a market order. That's it. So this is give me what you got right now. This is, I want better, something better than what's currently in market. This is, I want something worse than what's currently in market. So if the price goes up, then I'll buy. That kind of thing. But what happens with these dark pools is that they just make up their own rules. So they've come up with all these different kinds of orders, 
and if you do enough volume and you spend enough money, then you get to cut in line, and through a very long, convoluted process, you you get to improve your pricing and steal people's money because they don't get the same advantages that you do. They prioritize their gateways. Yes. Which is theoretically illegal, but apparently not in practice. And then this is the this is a good example of a broker-specific platform. Uh, it's sufficient if you want to do something really simple. So my favorite example with all my clients is a moving average cross. If the fast moving average clock crosses above the slow moving average, then maybe you buy or sell. This is okay for that, but it has some enormously frustrating limitations, like it doesn't have loops. So you can't do a for loop in think script. You can't do DLLs or anything. So if you want to do the absolute most bare minimum simple strategy possible, then this is okay. For anything remotely sophisticated, these are okay. And my personal preference is for these two just because they're stable. I use NinjaTrader more often because of the broker options, but in terms of research quality, these are pretty much on the same level in my opinion. Should be said for multi charts that they do allow you to choose your data feed. Yes. You know, they're not like trace, they're a clone translation, but they didn't know that aspect of it. Yeah, they do have some differences. You can choose your own feed. There are multiple brokers that'll take them. So uh, the, my biggest, really my only gripe with Trade Station is why am I going to pay for something that's free everywhere else? And I don't want to be married to one broker. Well, um, how much do you use the charting in these packages? Personally? Yeah. Never? Okay. So, I mean, for example, I had a consulting job where I had to do some charting. Okay. And so I use I, I got my, my regular package out, which is Think or Swim. I use their trading because it's a strong option analytics. Right. And uh, I found the charting is just totally deficient. So I've been looking at other packages. So I've been going to be very interested in hearing what you said about other, other packages charting capabilities. This one's far and away the best at least compared to this one. This one is, okay, there's some candlesticks on the chart and I can draw some lines, right. but that's about it. Ninja Trader, you can do all sorts of GUI stuff with. So if you want to custom program something to look how you want it, Ninja Trader will let you do it. Okay. Uh, it's not part of the documentation, but you can figure it out. Let me tell you what I had to do. I had to create um, the portfolios. First of all, I had to create portfolios that, that, that were applicated by 10 different portfolio managers. Okay. I then had to compare them from obviously on the same time scale, right? Um, but they're, they're composed of different securities. Okay. And furthermore, what each portfolio manager was recommending at a different period of time changed over time. Yes. So I had to, um, I had to, I had to first of all start my graph for the specific date, right. which I can't do in Think or Swim. Correct. And then I had to um, change all the graphs so they were relative scales. Okay. Because otherwise you can't compare you know, IBM and Cisco, you, you need a percentage. And like I said, any two different securities. So then I also had to take the base date, had to be different depending on when they made the recommendation. That had to be one, and it could be October the 19th of last year, it could be February the 14th of this year or whatever. Okay. And so I had to do all those things. I mean, can Ninja Trader um, do those things? I wouldn't use any of these for any kind of portfolio stuff. So this is, this is the big problem that seems to be coming up more, is these are all functioning on a single chart. So if you're trading Euro, the Euro against the US dollar, on NinjaTrader, you literally, okay, here's my Euro dollar chart, put the strategy on, turn it on, now it's trading the Euro dollar. And then I want to trade pound dollars, so I do the same thing, which is fine in isolation, but if you're trying to manage a portfolio, getting this to talk to this. The platform's not really designed to do it. You can jury rig it, but it's not gonna be, like, it's gonna A, involve a lot of manual labor, and B, you're gonna have to come up with your own way to talk, to A, know what has been loaded, and to make those prioritizing decisions about, okay, A, you have this much capital allocated to you, do what you're gonna do, and then do that for everything in the portfolio. I have a guy that does that. He has 70 or 80 charts open, and it's not fun, but he saved a lot of money by doing it in NinjaTrader. 
So it does work, but it comes at a cost. If you're, you know, if you're trying to do this and you're running a fund, you really you just, just build it from scratch. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah. Everybody's very quiet. I'm still thinking about how much money I lost. <laughs> All right. How many people have actually traded before in the live market? Okay. How many people have blown up accounts before? <coughs> the rest might have been it. Yeah. <laughs> how long have you been trading? Uh, it's uh, what, nine, nine, ten months. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, most people blow up in six months. So you're doing. I'm seriously, the fact that you haven't destroyed the account is very encouraging. <laughs> now, the I think it's. I forget what the stat is. I think it's. 90 or 95 percent of accounts opened at U.S. Forex brokerages are closed within either six months or, ten or a full year. And if you, it's not something, something they say on the front end when they're selling it, I would assume. I, they just overlooked <laughs> that. I don't know what happened. <laughs> they have the, the CFTC mandates that the CFTC is like the SEC for Forex, and the CFTC <clears throat> mandates that. All Forex brokers in the U.S., now there's only nine or ten of them, so it's really not a long list, publish every quarter the percentage of their clients that make money. And on the low end, consistently from quarter to quarter, you'll see something like 40%, and you'll see maybe something as high as 65%. So, and then you add that quarter by quarter. Profitability doesn't have anything to do with scale either. It means their account is one penny more or higher than it was six months ago. And what happens is with brokers, they have two ways of making money. And this is only for Forex. When you say Forex, does that mean just currency or? Yes, that's exclusively currencies, although that's kind of taken on silver and gold as well. Yeah, so let me write that. Forex equals currencies. And I probably should have asked this at the beginning, but is everybody familiar with the term Forex? Not on work? Yes. Hey, and you know why you can make money when the currency is? OK. Just want to make sure I'm not talking about people like this. OK. Two ways brokers can make money. Commissions or risk. Commissions are just like in the stock market. You buy a stock, you pay a penny a share, that's it. Forex does the same thing, uh, except the one thing that's unique about it is that they'll mark up the spread. So they'll say that they're receiving this bid and ask from the bank, and then they'll make it wider. So it's kind of like what I described to you before about buying a $10,000 car and selling it for eleven. dollars They might show you, the customer, sorry, 91. They might show you 91, and then as soon as you take the trade, they immediately flip it and sell it to the bank for 90. So that's that's how they make their money, and that's it's a markup in the spread, and that's all disclosed. So they have to tell you that we make our money by marking up the spread. It is not free. The second is way more popular, and frequently a warning sign of who you're working with is if the broker makes its money by taking on trading risk. And the reason this is lucrative is that you were talking about brokers publishing their quarterly reports, and where basically 40 to 60 percent of clients make money every month. But what happens is the us type traders, just regular guys off the street, they make money when volatility is low, but when it's high, they get utterly decimated. So the reason that is, is when you talk to most traders, they'll always talk about risk management. You've got to manage your risk. You've got to make sure that you live to fight another day. But for most people, that's a bunch of hot air. And what they do is they say, I'm losing 
price is going this way, they bought here. And then they're like, oh, it's coming back. Oh, it's coming back. Oh, it's coming back. Oh, I'm out of money. And then they don't have any money left. So their account, if you're on the opposite side of that, is now the property of the broker. But when volatility is low, people's natural tendency to do that works in their favor temporarily because the price, quote unquote, always comes back. So when volatility is low, and when I was a broker, it was 2005, and in Forex, that was absolute record low volatility ever. And so the firm I worked for was not making anywhere near as much money as it hoped. But then, in 2008, volatility was the opposite. And then voila, it's raining money. Because when volatility goes up, the brokers want those accounts. And the reason is, not only do most, this kind of doesn't, this doesn't make the statistics stand out as much as it should. So my favorite example is when I was a broker, I worked on funds called the sentiment fund. And all it did was give you a ratio of the number of people that were long and the number of people that were short. From what, from what source? Well, you're a broker, so you have a giant book of 100,000 accounts. Your clients. Your clients. Client base. Client yeah. Base. Okay. So you could say that 80% of clients are short the dollar against the yen, and then, or sorry, 80% are long and 20% are short. But if this was the current market, it would be the opposite because it's been skyrocketing. Okay, why is this important? Because the retail crowd is always wrong. Always, like it's a guaranteed <laughs> thing. Okay, so if you have access to the order book, you know where the market's going. It's just a matter of time because these guys are going to get pressured. So in this scenario that I highlighted, okay, I'm frustrating myself because I keep switching which example I'm using. Let's say that only 20% are long, 80% are short in this example. The way this ratio works is it grows over time. So here, it might be something like 50-50, where you have this nice flat market and not a lot's happening. But as the market goes down, these guys won't just hang into the trade. They'll start, they'll buy here, and then they'll buy here. And then you reach this critical point where, okay, I'm starting to run out of money. Uh, I need to start closing some trades, so I'm going to go short. Then you have the trend traders that are hopping in, and they're saying, wow, this thing's starting to get some legs, so I'm going to go short. And all these buys start becoming more selling pressure so that you get those overextended moves. As this is happening, the ratio starts getting worse. So here it might start at 50. And when you get to some extreme point like here, it might be 20. And then some currencies, uh, I mean, literally, can be 10% are short into this kind of move. And the other 90% are swearing up and down it's coming back. If you're the broker and you have access to this kind of information, it's a gold mine. And if you're taking on the risk and you manage it appropriately, then you can make a lot of money. But the problem is that for a business, it's not really nice cash flow. It all comes in and over the course of two months and the other 10 months, they're just hemorrhaging money. Quick question on that point. I've noticed Fidelity will make that information available to their customers now as far as kind of what people are trading percentage, whatever, a variety of items like that. Are you seeing, is that pretty common amongst brokers these days? Is that becoming kind of a standard thing? Yeah, absolutely. So when I, when I was doing this managed fund and they had a strategy built, built around it, this was public information. So anybody that had an account there could go see what this was and trade on it. Uh, and now it's even more public than it used to be. And there's a couple of different websites that are forex specific where all of this stuff is published and they're not brokers which is the interesting thing so my fx book is one of the ones that i like to use and oh and uh, i 
yeah, we had to publish this their data too. For my ethics book, it's everybody that has a MetaTrader account, which is probably like 70% of retail Forex traders. They hook up to this my FX book, and then it gives them all these cool analytics and stuff. But they're reading the market positioning from all of these 100,000 customers all at the same time. So they have something like $100 million of client funds in different positioning that they get to see every minute that the market's open. And you can just go on their website and look at it and see minute by minute, oh, this is, and they have graphs now, and it goes back to, and this is relatively new. It only goes back to, I think, October. But you can see the positioning minute by minute in all the major currency pairs, which I think is awesome. I've long wanted to build a strategy around it. I just have not had the time. But as a bunch of potential quantitative traders, uh, that would be my place to look, because that strategy works really well. Just bet against the crown. That's it. Uh, the ratio, yeah, the thing that we used in the fund was a three to one ratio. So if anybody, if any group is 75% one direction, pretty good bet that if, and then you can add in other filters. The best is if, if, if volatility is high and they're all betting one way, then, you know, bet the farm. <laughs> how's, how's it look stock market wise right now? Is that is, is it out of whack right now like that? But personally, I wouldn't participate because I don't know where the money's coming from. So I was telling before the meeting started that most retail money has been flowing out of the stock market for I don't know, probably the last two, three years, pretty much since two thousand eight, where everybody took those massive losses in their pensions and their mutual funds. And everybody's just sick of it and been pulling out money. Uh, and except for a couple of months, for the most part, it's just been tens of billions of dollars that are withdrawn from the stock market since the last crash. And then you have all the negative news, like the flash crash. And I don't think people know the details, but I do think that there's a growing sense of, I shouldn't trust this and participate because I think this is not in my favor. I don't know if that really relates to Forex platforms and all this discussion, but hopefully uh, you're finding it interesting. <clears throat> what percentage of the market movement <clears throat> and the psychology of the market is driven by institutional money as opposed to you know, grandma gets upset, sells her beach as well, and all forms of the curve? Okay, so there's a really big news story that was on CNBC recently involving Carl Icahn and some other big fund manager. I don't remember his name. The Ackman. Ackman, yeah. So it's Icahn and Ackman. And they have this ongoing feud about the company Herbalife. Yeah. Okay. Icahn swears up and down this is a, a phenomenal company that has great prospects and he thinks it's got a 50 or $60 target and it's trading around 40. And this guy thinks it's a zero. Well, CNBC had some unusually entertaining television where these guys are basically just yelling at each other for 15 minutes and saying this is going up and this is going to zero. Well, the, the interesting thing about this is that the day that happened, uh, the, the market was actually going down, but the shares that Icon was buying Herbalife were going up pretty dramatically. So what's been happening is that he went from a very nominal stake like 2% to way over 10%, where now he's had to disclose it as a major uh, holding in his fund, to the point where it seems like it's just a big one of these to Ackman, because it's literally the day that they got in this feud He's messing with the stock price and buying, you know, ten percent of the shares that are available every day. Uh, so Herbal Life is maybe uh, thinly traded, small. No, it's a big company. company. Yeah, but these guys also, you know, they manage billions of dollars. So if if you want to just have a you know a little fight with your favorite enemy, you could do that. And if you've got the money to do it, then you can move that stock around as much as you want. And as long as you got the money to do it. So I, 
does that happen in the in, in the forex market, futures market? It doesn't seem that you'd be able to do this sort of thing to that extent. No. Uh, in forex, you would have to be an institution to possibly move the market, barring some little exception. Like I've heard of colleagues that have, you know, some wealthy guy in the Middle East with a hundred million to blow that oops, I bought a yard like a yard is a billion. I have, uh, he just wants to gamble and for no apparent reason just buys too much and then now he owns a billion euros and he bought it in five minutes. That's going to affect the market. I see. Okay. But for the guys that are participating on a retail level, the average account size is ten or twenty thousand dollars. In Forex, that's, yeah, you don't know that's happening. Yeah. But the institutional guys can't move the market quite as, as much in futures and in the forex market as they possibly could in the equity market. Correct, because and that's just a function of liquidity. So if you if you're investing with a penny stock, I can move a penny stock. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, when you start going up to small cap, mid cap, right. the higher the valuation and the higher the amount of money traded, the more difficult messing with the price is. Yeah, last Christmas, not not this Christmas, last Christmas said the drunk trader Bought 545 million uh, Brent crude, and the market sure enough, slowly but surely went up. And they yep. finally traced it back to one dude. He was literally drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you think it can't happen, but it really is just the most trivial reasons <coughs> with these guys with way too much money under management. But it just, you know, stupid things happen, and it really. <laughs> What's that one where it has the picture of Tyler Durden and I can't remember the name? That's Zero Edge. Zero Edge, yeah. They got all sorts of good articles about that. I so love them, yeah. The, this group topic of algorithmic trading is probably not popular on that kind of site. But yeah, I love Zero Edge. I read it every day. And that's actually where I got the Icon Ackman feud was they did a hilarious little piece. And they used much more colorful language than I did. <laughs> but uh, they, if, if you want to know what's happening macro, Zero Edge is a great place. He was saying that they have a full quarter of a second now inside the exchange before it has to leave the exchange. Really? A full quarter of a second. Okay. Interesting. Let's see in the end. Okay. How would the uh, events in the country affect the um, uh, growth and like, uh, the graphs? Well, it depends, but for the most part, the driver of Currencies are interest rates. That's the theory. So if you look at this from not a speculation standpoint, you just look at it from traditional trade back in the 1970s, you might look at a, co a country that has phenomenal exports and huge growth opportunities and okay, I'm looking at Mongolia and they have something like 15% interest rates. And then here in the U.S., we're making zero. So, well, that sounds more appealing. So, what most people do is they sell into the currency that has the higher interest rate. Uh, and then as these interest rates rise over time, people tend to follow and chase that rate. So, that's generally what causes currencies to move. But, we're in the middle of a currency war where everybody wants their interest rate to be zero. So it's totally skewed. Because the way the market should quote unquote be is really everybody racing to keep their rates at zero and whoever gets their rate to zero and most persuasively convinces everybody that it will be at zero for the longest period of time will have the weakest currency. So if you think about a country like Japan, which is been the hot topic in the currency market recently. They're an exporter. They're an island. Uh, they're totally dependent on their exports. So when you look at a currency pair like the dollar yen, which literally died dating back to the 1970s, looks like that. So if you're interested in ultra long term trading, that's the yen after World War II traded at something like 500, and now it's been at 90 and it's been as low as 70. 
the problem with Japan is that when the price is going down, what that means is that the dollar is weakening and the yen is going up. And if you're an exporter, that's a big problem. Because, okay, let, about five years ago, the yen traded at 120. Okay, so now it's increased in value by a third in five years. Mm -hmm. So Toyota is selling cars for, I don't know what an appropriate price is in yen, maybe 100,000 yen. Actually, that's probably way too low. 500,000 yen? Well, it's still 500,000 yen, but when you put that back in dollar terms, it's probably gone from 12,000 to 16,000. So for Toyota, they are getting crushed when the yen keeps gaining value. Yeah. And when you say there's a currency war, what that means is that all these people are trying to improve their exports by destroying their currencies. So the best way to do that is to make it completely unattractive. So, okay, you want to put your money in yen, fine, but I'm not going to pay you any interest. Well, over time, if nobody else was playing this game, you would win. Yen would start going like that. And uh, there have been a lot of hiccups along the way where the yen will go up 100 or 1,500 pips or so. And a lot of that is from the bank intervening in the market and actively buying the currency. But for the most part, if you want to destroy a currency, you can. The current environment is that it's not just Japan. Now it's the US. Now it's Switzerland. The Euro to a large extent. South Korea is getting involved. You have all these, uh, yeah, you have all of, oh, yeah, and then you have Great Britain, which is also doing its own quantitative easing. So pretty much every major currency in the world is trying to devalue itself competitively, where everybody wants to be zero, but everybody can't be zero. So instead of speculating on who is going to have the best interest rate in the next six months, what you're really speculating on is who is going to do the worst job at destroying their currency because they'll be the best, which is insane. How, how is the U.S. doing? Are we top? We should be. I don't know why people think the dollar is a great place. I think it's a disaster. But uh, yeah, we're. I think it's. Um, it's the best disaster. <laughs> so far, it's been the best disaster, uh, depending on your perspective. Uh, Japan has been most convincingly destroying its currency, why, which is why in the last six months it's been heading up. I think the euro is a disaster in the long run in terms of functioning as a currency, but the reason it's been so strong is that all of the dysfunction in the euro, the same reason that they can't kick Greece out, that they can't kick Spain out, that they can't make anybody follow their own rules, also prevents them from being good at manipulating their interest rates. Mm -hmm. So they're still in the one point one and a quarter range, whereas the news over the last year, up until the last Fed meeting this week, has been, we're going to print money into infinity, we're going to keep interest rates at zero for the next decade, practically. So here everybody is like, yep, they're staying at zero, nothing's going to change, and here there's no reason to think anything's going to change. So you see a little bit more movement into the euro, even though I think you know it could collapse any time. But over the short run, looking at the interest rate, this is a better deal than that for now. Talking about third world currencies, then you introduce a component of social risk. Right? Yeah, and then you have other things. So uh, obvious examples. September 11th, right? The dollar's going crazy. Uh, social war, those kind of things. Uh, that changes it on the flip of the switch, and everybody's going to start buying or selling depending on what the perceived risk is. Uh, I don't remember what happened when Fukushima was going on in Japan, but I would wager it was not good for the yen. Um, a lot of these other things aren't. Like you see the prices move in response to news, but they don't move in any kind of fundamental way. Yeah. It's not like 9-11 happens and then yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it's like, oh, okay, maybe I need to start rethinking this. And then over the next two or three months is when it really goes kaput. Uh, what you see more is that when you have those big moves, those tend to be inflection points. But if it's really going to change people's permanent or outlook for the next six or 12 months, it takes a while for the herd to change direction. So, so third world countries where you have no no, no, no long-term or even medium-term uh, guarantee that the currency is even remotely stable. Right. How do you trade those types of currencies? Well, for the most part, you don't. Because of those completely. Yeah. Right, because, I, I mean, it depends. If you're doing algorithmic trading, you need liquidity. Because algorithmic yeah, yeah, trading, yeah, yeah. You're, you're pretty active. Right. So you need a thin spread. If you trade something a little more exotic, like South African Rand yeah. or Turkish Lira, so the spread goes up. Goes it's way up. Okay. And this might be eight or nine times as much as it costs to trade the euro against the dollar. Right. Okay. So you can do this. And then when you go crazy, you, know, you start talking about trading, um, I don't know, that's an example, Chilean pesos. Nobody is speculating in the peso, so you can. There are there are algorithms, and you can trade with HSBC. They specialize in that that kind of thing, but your spread's going to be like that. So yeah. you're not going to be day trading the peso. No. Well, not the Chilean peso, maybe the Mexican peso. I see. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I've been dying to ask you what do you think is the best strategy for somebody with less than fifty. Are you trading? Trading futures. Um, it, is it like a proportional system of some sort, or is it? Is it? Because um, I've tried proportional systems, and they've worked for a while, but then unfortunately I was one of the fools who put Ninja Trader's 64-bit on his machine, and it had the SQL Server bug in it, where when it hit the low of the day, it stayed at the low of the day. Oh, yeah. That's not good. I didn't know about that bug. Yes. About 18 months later, I found out. Oh. My neural good. network kept saying, this is great, one direction. It was great. And I made money and zero losses for 36 hours. And then slowly but surely, over the next five months, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit every day. Wow. But yeah, I just was wondering, what is a good worthwhile strategy that you think, for somebody like me, would be good for, I mean, you see people's strategies all day long. Yeah, most people's strategies are random. So if you're doing analysis, kind of like a, a pure quant, the biggest problem is that the market is highly random. It's not entirely random, but it's really, really random. So my favorite example is I work with this professor who does financial markets, but he also works in cryptography. And he did a little experiment where he decided to use market data to see if that was random enough for him to generate his cryptography. He found it wasn't good enough. So it's, it's enough that it looks random, but there are patterns in there that you can tease out. But doing that from like a data mining perspective is incredibly complex. So for somebody with our type size accounts, I always recommend a total opposite approach where instead of data mining and messing with MATLAB and all those kind of things is just simple stuff like uh, like the strategy I, I mentioned, the, the market position. I don't know what would, well in futures it's a lot more long term because you have the commitment of traders and that report will tell you on a weekly basis that X number of traders are long WTI and the commercials are doing the exact opposite of what the retail traders are. And just like in the Forex market, the, the retail traders lose pretty consistently, not a guarantee. And the commercials are almost always right. There are exceptions. The most popular one was uh, when gold started picking up in, I think, 2009. Uh, that was one huge counterexample. The commercials were short the whole way. Uh, and they lost tons and tons and tons of money, and the retail traders actually were right. So it's not ironclad, but for the most part, 
when WTI went up to 140, the retail traders are short the whole time. Mm -hmm. So this one's hard because it only is updated weekly. So it really depends on what and how actively you're trying to be involved in the market. Uh, but you'd be hard pressed to get it ridiculously wrong. Uh, that's probably a safer way. For Forex, it would be some kind of sentiment. So uh, whenever I'm, I, I try to trade algorithmically, but whenever I just feel the need to pull the slot machine and start trading, I will use my FX book. And I just do a really simple strategy and deprogram. Yeah, I built a neural network with, um, and I use Streambase for my uh, complex event processing. Okay. And so it was in .NET, like I said, the first 64-bit version of NinjaTrader came out, but I was using a proportional strategy where I took an institutional feed from uh, HotFX, uh, HotFXI, okay. and so I did proportional. So the euro has 12% of the market, this other one has a certain percentage of the market, and then did a correlation on those to see what the proportion is in the actual exchange traded half of that currency. Okay. And so every, there's change you can make, you make a short chain like eight currencies or 26 currencies or 100 or something or so. And so um, I guess we're, I'm, I'm trying to find something opposite simpler but something that you think is more reliable because you're talking about the sentiment analysis. This sounds much more realistic. Yeah, it is. It's totally realistic. Like they, these have, they have an API that you can use and something I've been wanting to mess with for a while, I just haven't got around to it, is looking at uh, long term. So maybe pull up the four hour chart and they have these cool lines where green is long and red is short. And this is, obviously these are bigger numbers and that's a smaller number. So whenever this line is above this line, if, if these guys are short and this is long, well, there are more shorts than longs, so I want to be long. And just try something, I mean, it's really stupid simple. The line's above this line, buy. Right. Um, and this, this, I've only investigated it by eye, but it works. And because I know, I mean, they, they managed a massive amount of money doing this type of strategy. And I've eyeballed it, and it looks fantastic. It caught that yen move that went from 70 to 90. Wow. Um, and it, uh, it's still long, I think. Everybody is still massively short the dollar against the yen. Yeah, I've seen a three and a half to four hour typical window before like a, a currency will tend to you know, retrace or invert. But um, doing this, it sounds much more um, stable. It's way more stable. The only thing is, uh, and then you were mentioning like the math behind it, is that the, the biggest obstacle for me with trading is getting used to the distribution of returns. Because most people, when they're thinking about trading, is they want it to be an ATM machine, where they go out every day and they pull out their 100 bucks. But the, the way the math in the market is, is it doesn't work that way. So like 80% of the time, it's just noise. There's nothing happening. And if you want, you can play in it. But the problem is that when these big tail events happen, you get massively destroyed. So you can play this game, but you're going to give it all back when this happens. And where you make the most money is when these kind of things happen and the trends really start to blow up. This catches it, and that's as simple as it gets. I work with a client that builds a very sophisticated neural network on this type of math. And his returns are the exact same, where it's three months of losing a percent, two percent, something like that, and then you have one trade that makes you twenty-five percent. So it's you just have to, and I've I've messed with that a ton, where it's like, come on, place a trade every day, you know, like people want signals, they want to see some action, but it just it doesn't work. So you got to get rid of everything that you want to see and just let the market do what it's going to do, even if you don't quite like it. And my opinion is that the best strategies don't make money consistently. They just, you know, whenever it's there, they grab it, but for the most part, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, ups and downs. Mm -hmm.
I'm going to be charged with five minutes, so I need my code. <laughs> what, what, what's your consulting I'll give you like per hour, man. I need ten. Uh, ben, Benjamin here has a, uh, he does a program called Quantopian, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it now analyzes uh, market data. And what's, I'm not really sure the best way to describe it, but it does like NinjaTrader does, where you can go in and do back testing and find optimal trades. Okay. Does, it, does it do any optimization? No, it, you, you, the idea of Quantopian is that you do everything yourself. They just provide a platform for you to do it on. So it's more of the people that are interested in doing their analysis themselves and not relying on the, I, I guess, the analysis and charts that seem to become popular with MetaTrader. Yeah, and it's hand-holding, but a lot less of it. I have an in-house quant in Barclays now, or I have some in-house quant now. They call it a standing quant okay. at, at uh, Barclays, one of the big shops now. And I'm just trying to figure out uh, have you seen anybody use a, 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 an adapter in, because it's written in Python, anything for NinjaTrader in Python maybe that we could pull in his, all the stuff he's doing into analyzing our price stuff? Uh, when you start getting all those platforms to talk together, it becomes a huge programming problem because the way they organize everything is just completely different across different platforms. So the reason why I ask is because then a trader. I mean, a uh, uh, trade station pays a lot. Makes you pay a lot of money to do analysis. If you, you know, buy a continuous contract, I think it's like three hundred dollars just for one one CD for that one instrument. Right. But everything Benjamin's got it going. It seems like it should be a way we can short circuit the process. Well, I don't. I don't work for Quantopian, but they they're trying to solve that problem. I mean, they're, they're, that's what they're they're going to do. Is you can do everything in there. You can do all your analysis. That's what they want to do, I should say. Okay. They are currently negotiating contracts with individual brokers. They might try and go after MetaTrader and NinjaTrader as well to wow. solve some of those problems. There's reasonable expectations that you can do language translations from, from Python to C Sharp. It's not, it's not terrible. Um, you can do some Python to .NET as well. Um, does it save your data? Is your data mostly in CSV file format, or what is format is your data in usually? On, on Quantopia? Uh -huh. uh, or does it I matter? think that they, well, the data is not, is hidden. You, you can't really see what it is. Uh, okay. Right, that, that's how they, they worked out their contract with. Um, so, see, so they have tick, tick data, but you don't get access to it. You just can test your, you can do, run your back test solution against it. But you can't see what the actual values are. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So, I so I you get. I looked at Zipline and I guess I got confused or something. I must have. Yeah, no. Z so Zipline's their back tester, and they can. You can get the uh, the analysis is legitimate, but the values are not um, representative of what the actual values are. So they're relative, something like that. Because we can put a neural network in NinjaTrader. And we can parse data with NinjaTrader from any feed. That's the good thing about NinjaTrader. Mm -hmm. And it's it's only forty nine bucks a month. So if we can get it to play with Quantopian and then have several instances of Quantopian running to parse that. Right, well that that's how Quantopian is probably going to make money, is they want to make that easy for you, but they want to uh, that's how find a way to charge you for it. Yeah, that. that's how they're gonna charge you for it. It's when you want to take your, your strategy and then connect it up to a broker or to Ninja Trader. But at the moment, it's not, it's not possible there. It's a sort of limited Python environment. It's not totally open, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, so what you do most of the time is you formalize people's trading strategies into uh, automatic models. Yes, so somebody will say a really simple strategy that I used earlier was the moving average. Right. This one is the fast, and this one is the slow. When the fast crosses above the slow, I read these two moving averages, and I see that this is above this, but it was below before. So now we buy. Right. Okay. So now um, you've been doing that for uh, how long? Five years. Five years. So has there been a, a large increase in people wanting to formalize their yeah. trading strategies? Yeah. Absolutely. Trading? Yeah. Um, it's kind of mixed. Um, more of the market is people that want to buy expert advisors and algorithms that other people have done. Yeah. 
Uh, but you did, there is a lot, I mean, my entire business is built around it, of people that have their own ideas that they want to automate, and yeah. then they tell us what it is, and then we make the software for them, usually in MetaTrader or MetaTrader. Okay. So it's, it's a growing business? Yeah, definitely. So I've always been amazed at these traders you meet who will sit in front of the screen all day doing something. You ask somebody, if they want to talk about what their strategy is, you realize it's totally automated. Yeah. You know, maybe you should be walking the dog. Well, that's actually the most common. We have two kind of clients. One are the guys that have been trading for a year or two, where they have experience and they want to investigate ideas. Yeah. And then we have the guys that know what their strategy is, that have been trading for at least a decade, and some of them literally 25, 30 years, and they just do this, I can't get up at 2 in the morning to trade the euro anymore. And, okay, here are the rules, send it off, and they're done. Which is the most powerful um, programming, or um, trading specific programming language? I like NinjaTrader uh, because I personally prefer C Sharp, and it's written in C Sharp, and I'm there are limitations. I, I have cranked NinjaTrader to the point where it won't run anymore. Um, so if you're doing calculations that you need to multi-thread, then you need to move it out of NinjaTrader. But if it's getting, if it's somewhere between maxing out one processor, but you don't need to quite multi-thread, then NinjaTrader is the best solution. MetaTrader will choke long before you get there. And TradeStation, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to write a DLL anyway. So maybe we should we should wrap up there, and if any people want to stick around, we can sort of yeah. socialize. Let's thank. Uh, thank you guys found it useful that yeah. I'll be around. So yes. Yeah.